Hello, my name is April Hewlett and I'm with the University of Idaho and today we're going to talk about invasive plants and weeds. I want to start by talking about origin and when we think about the word origin we're referring to areas where plants have evolved. For example, we say we have native plants and we have introduced plants. Native plants are typically have originated in North America. Introduced plants are um, plants that were intentionally or accidentally brought to North America. Within these two categories, we also have invasive species and noxious weeds that we'll be talking about today. Invasive species are based on different plant characteristics that makes them invasive. Noxious weeds are weeds that have been specifically identified as noxious by the law. All organisms have a home where they've existed and evolved for thousands of years. A native or indigenous species is one that occurs in a plant community without the help of humans. This is not always easy to determine, but one of the factors we often consider. Species native to North America are generally those that occurred prior to European settlement. So the question is then, how long have they been here? An organism's home is also determined by a host of influences. Native plants are well adapted to local climate patterns, soils, animals, and microbes. Introduced plants are plants or organisms that have been introduced by humans to an area outside of its natural home range. Introduced plants are often called other names such as non-native, exotic, alien, foreign, non-indigenous. All of these things refer to introduced species. And this designation applies to species that were introduced from other continents, but also other ecosystems or even another habitat within the ecosystem. Since the discovery of America in the 15th century, people have played a very significant role in moving plants, animals, diseases, and other organisms around the world to places far beyond their native home range. Right now, it's estimated that there's approximately 3,500 species of plants that have escaped cultivation and become established and naturalized in native ecosystems. So think for a minute, how did and how are humans introducing non-native plants? Some of the ways could be through grains and food crops, seeds in ships, ornamentals, plants for erosion control. Historically, we brought plants over from Eurasia that established quickly so we could reduce erosion. Plants with high forage value have been introduced, and we always can introduce them accidentally. Introduction of exotic plants continue today and it's increasing due to the large and ever expanding human population. Many of these species, native or introduced, can exist harmoniously in many different ecosystems. However, how native and introduced species respond to new environmental conditions influences whether we consider them to be invasive species. Invasive species are those that establish and spread over large areas and persist. Persistent invasive species often displace our native species. Here I have two examples of a non-native and a native plant. So we have cheatgrass or downy broom, which is a non-native introduced annual. This annual grass can easily invade after disturbance and use resources, making it difficult for our native plant species to reestablish. The other native plant is a juniper tree, and this is a native tree that due to fire suppression has started to encroach on sagebrush steppe ecosystems. And when we say encroach, it means that it's coming in and it's displacing native plant species, particularly sagebrush and perennial grasses, and making it difficult for them to stay established in their ecosystems. Think for a moment about some of the growth characteristics that you think invasive species have that allows them to dominate an ecosystem. Some of the characteristics include that they're abundant seed producers. Russian thistle, which is an invasive species, can produce over 200,000 seeds per plant. They also have a long-term survival of seeds. Leafy spurge, for example, can have a viable seed for up to eight years. 
sagebrush, a species that we actually want, you, it typically has a viable seed for one to two years, if we're lucky. Invasive species have rapid po population establishment. They're often pioneer species after disturbance, meaning that they come in and they're first to occupy a disturbed site. This gives them a competitive advantage. Cheatgrass, a winter annual, can use the resources more quickly in the spring than our native species, making them more competitive. Invasive species also lack natural enemies. These can include things like insects or microbes or even animals that control populations in their native environments. In natural resources, we often hear weeds and noxious weeds, and we need to understand the difference in these two terms. So what is a weed? A weed is a plant of little value or any plant that's really out of place. It often competes with crops and native plants and it can affect um, the health and the productivity of native landscapes. It's kind of interesting to read different definitions that describe weeds. Here's one from the Applied Weed Science Society. And here's one from Ralph Waldo Emerson, which I really like. A weed is a plant whose virtues have not yet been discovered. So sometimes when we're dealing with weeds, maybe we just haven't discovered all the virtues. What is a noxious weed then? The real difference between weeds and noxious weeds are that noxious weeds are designated by law. It typically has economic damage and it's a threat to human interests. Noxious weeds do not encompass all of invasive plant species or other weeds. For example, in Idaho, there are hundreds of weed species. However, there are only 67 that are designated noxious by the Idaho law. In comparison, there's 47 noxious weeds in Nevada and there's 27 noxious weeds in Utah. So I'd like you to take a few minutes and watch War of the Weeds. This was a video that was done by Outdoor Idaho and it's really well done and it talks about some of the plant species that you have to memorize for this class that are noxious weeds. And it also just makes some really interesting points and discusses the difficulties that we have with noxious weeds and natural resources. So it's definitely worth your time and there most likely will be a question from the video on the next exam. So hopefully after you watch the video by Outdoor Idaho, you have some idea of how weeds can impact rangelands. We'll briefly discuss a few here. One, they reduce biological diversity. That means not just in plants do we lose diversity, but we also lose insect and wildlife due to these big monocultures that they create. Monocultures meaning one species. They can alter the hydrologic conditions or alter soil characteristics. And we'll talk about that when we talk about salt cedar in a minute, which is one of the plants you need to memorize for this class. They can alter fire intensity and frequency. We always talk about the cheatgrass wildfire cycle in natural resources, especially here in the West. Basically, cheatgrass comes in, it dries quickly and makes our rangelands very flammable. A fire occurs, and what's the species that comes back after fire? Cheatgrass. Cheatgrass again dries out, and so we are in this wildfire cycle that is shorter than it typically was. They interfere with natural succession. They compete for native pollinators, and they can displace rare plant species. All of these things negatively impact rangelands. So as part of this section, I'm going to introduce four different plants that you need to memorize for this class and be able to identify for the exam. So we have two different forbs and two different woody species that we'll talk about. The first one is leafy spurge. Leafy spurge is an introduced perennial noxious weed. Some of the ways you can identify leafy spurge is by its yellow-green colored flowers that are arranged in tight clusters of seven to, de seven to ten flowers. These are surrounded by a really showy heart-shaped brack. This is the characteristic that I use most often when I'm in the field to, to distinguish leafy spurge. Leafy spurge has roots that can reach depths of 30 feet. 
And a lot of these roots are really dark and they have pink buds on the roots. And these buds allow them to reproduce by seed and by roots. Leafy spurge also has a milky resin. So if you break the stem, you can see that it has milk, a milky resin inside. Here are a few more images of leafy spurge invasions in rangelands. You can see how they grow in really tight clusters. And essentially they start to create this monoculture as they expand in these systems. The next plant is spotted knapweed. And this is a perennial that's introduced it is also a noxious weed. So some of the characteristics that help you identify spotted knapweed is that it has a composite seed head. And if you can't remember what a composite seed head is, go back to the morphology um, presentation and look at that again. This particular plant has disc flowers in it. The lower leaves on spotted knapweed are also a good characteristic to identify it. They are typically deeply lobed and hairy. One of the reasons that it's called spotted knapweed is because it has distinct spots on the head of the flower. These are um, bracts, and on each of the bracts it has a black tip that's directly under the flower head. And so that's where you can see the spots. Salt cedar is the next plant. This is a perennial introduced noxious weed and it was introduced as an ornamental and can be found in a lot of our riparian areas. It definitely likes to have um, moisture, so it's in riparian areas. Some of the characteristics that distinguish salt cedar is that it has um, a feathery green or blue green foliage as you can kind of start to see in that image. It also has a wider pink flower that grows um, and clusters along the tip of the stem. And in the spring, this is a great characteristic to distinguish salt cedar. And you can see from these pictures why it was considered an ornamental. When it blooms, it's actually really beautiful. Um, these plants, though, like we said, are highly inv invasive, especially in riparian areas, and they use a lot of water. One of the techniques that salt cedar has is that it contains a lot of salt, and when the leaves fall in the fall because it's deciduous, it puts salt into the soils, and these salts make it difficult for any of our other species to survive, hence giving them a competitive edge to dominate the plant community. The last plant that you need to learn today is juniper. And we talked about juniper. So juniper is kind of our unique one here in that it's perennial, but it's a native plant. So it's a native plant that's encroaching on sagebrush steppe ecosystems in a lot of our western areas. Some of the characteristics that you can use to identify juniper are that the leaves look like overlapping scales. They're pressed really close to the twigs and they overlap. The fruit on juniper or the berry-like fruit is often bright blue, but also contains the kind of a white chalky coating on the outside. Junipers are evergreen, meaning they're not deciduous. So these leaves stay on year round and so they can photosynthesize all year long. Due to fire suppression, like I mentioned earlier, juniper encroachment on rangeland is displacing a lot of our sagebrush step communities like sagebrush and perennial grasses and forbs. This also, also alters the hydraulic cycle by increasing bare ground, so we have higher erosion rates. This makes it really difficult for any kind of native plant species to come back. So it's essentially a native that's outcompeting other native plants. Juniper, although we cut down a lot of it now in, um, due to sage grouse issues, it also is important to keep in some places. It is native and it does provide great winter habitat for a lot of our wildlife species like mule deer and elk. So those are the four plant species that you need to memorize for the upcoming exam. And um, good luck.